take a look at this magnificent Stone Age axe. Uh, there's another prehistoric one here. This is from the Bronze Age. And uh, there's a lovely, delicate Roman pewter bowl. The amount of craftsmanship that's gone into all of these things is very, very impressive. But the fascinating thing about them is that not one of them is more than 20 years old. Every single one of these beautiful objects is a Time Team replica. The legacy of nearly a hundred archaeological experiments and demonstrations. This is a controversial area of archaeology, but on Time Team we've discovered that rebuilding, reliving and sometimes blowing up the past can tell us so much more than just digging alone. In this programme, we're going to revisit the very best of our endeavours to bring history to life. So what have we learned about the way we once lived? And can we today ever truly understand what it was like to live thousands or even hundreds of years ago? a few miles from the Sussex coast, hundreds of men-at-arms clash in a surge of noise and steel. But this is no brutal struggle to the death. It's one of the largest historical reenactments in the world. Welcome to the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October, 2012. This is living history, and in recent years it's become hugely popular. Crowds flock to watch events like this one, organised once a year by English Heritage at Battle Abbey. On Time Team, we've been staging our own living history demonstrations for the last 20 years. We've found that they can be a useful first step towards understanding what life was like hundreds of years ago. At the 1066 battle camp, Time Team archaeologist Phil Harding is discovering that even lunch can be turned into a part of the action. He's been invited by a group of Norman reenactors to sample a traditional 11th century meal based on a depiction in the Bayer tapestry. This isn't just a, a, a sitting down eating, this is actually us recreating a documented historical event. What are the value of this? Because I'm sure a lot of people say, oh, all you're doing is just dressing up and all you're doing is sitting down enjoying yourself. We're, we're providing the public as they come through with not only the, the sights and, and sounds of, of, of William at his table, but the smells as well. At its best, yeah? Reenactment and, and reconstruction, living history, provides um, experiences that you're never going to get off the page. On Time Team, we've found that you don't have to go back to the dim and distant past to appreciate just how different life once was. Back in 2007 at Shooter's Hill in London, we turned back the clock just 70 years to one of the darkest moments in British history. In 1940, this quiet suburb was part of Stop Line Central, one of the capital's last lines of defence against a Nazi invasion. We'd come here to find what was left of it, and we discovered a network of hidden trenches and secret shelters designed to slow the Germans down. But archaeology couldn't begin to tell us what it would have felt like or what the experience was of training to repel a German invasion of southern England. So we asked Time Team's Phil Harding and Matt Williams to try out some of the Home Guard's weapons and tactics. I'm not looking very happy about this. No. But could this thing go off? It could do if his, his finger was on the firing pin and you'd lose your hands. <laughs> Matt and Phil's drills culminated with an attack on an armoured Austin Healy which the Home Guard really did use to simulate a panzer tank. Oh, God, stone of crows. 
I mean, I'd pity a tank or anybody on the receiving end of that. There's only one small problem. This was developed before the Second World War began. By the time the war actually has been fought, the Germans have upgunned and up-armoured their tanks. It wouldn't make a hole in it, which is why the Home Guard had this thing. Having got the Panzer crew's attention with their pop gun, the only option left for our daring duo was to get up close and personal. Arsh out smoke, and you throw your smoke bomb, your phosphorus bomb, from a distance, creates a big cloud of smoke. Then you run in to 15 feet away, where you're safe. They can't see you. And then I'll shout, stick, you bang your bomb on, you, then I'll count to four, and then five will be bang, and you have got to run. By the time I've shouted bang, you've got to be far enough away, otherwise I feel it's probably curtains for both of you. All right, let's do it. Good luck. Smoke! Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Stick! One! Two, three, oh, four, <laughs> bang! Oh no, we've lost one. Oh, I think he copped it. It was a heroic death, though. But it's more dangerous than I thought, you know. <laughs> now, we wouldn't claim that reenactment like this is an archaeological experiment, but it isn't just playing at soldiers either. At Shooter's Hill, it made us appreciate just how outnumbered and outgunned and how brave the men of the Home Guard would have been against Hitler's Blitzkrieg. Reenactment spectaculars are usually battles, but we found it doesn't have to be about fighting to have a big impact. Sometimes just trying to recreate everyday life can be surprisingly emotional for those who take part. In 2002, at Appleby in Cumbria, the local police force asked us to dig up their car park to look for the remains of three former prisons dating from the 17th century to the reign of Queen Victoria. And in return, we persuaded local sergeant Grant Warwick to lock up one of our archaeologists, Jim Mower, for a day. Jim, this is it. I come quietly? Yeah. Come with me, young man. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, mate. Thank you very Off much. You go. OK, come on then. Lead the Archaeologists way. and crew, can I have a word just for a moment? We want, to, we want to do this properly with Jim. So for the next 24 hours, nobody talks to him. No <laughs> jokes or gags, no slipping him bits of food. He really is going to be in a 19th century prison regime. He's absolutely persona non grata. Thank God for that, they got him at last. Stop, one hour, 3,000 turns, don't stop. We wanted to see if we could completely strip away the modern world and replicate the harsh regime of a 19th century prison. The Victorians believed that punishing prisoners with repetitive physical tasks gave them time to contemplate their moral failings. So, with the occasional nod to 21st century health and safety, we got Jim to do what they did. It's lunchtime now, and all the archaeologists and the crew have gone to location catering. I think it's uh, tuna teriyaki today, but Jim has got this. Stop! It didn't take long for the experiment to have an effect on Jim, who had a video camera to capture his thoughts. You lose all sense of time, and you have no idea what time it is. I can see a little bit of sunlight coming through the windows, but that's it. Um, the monotony is quite unbelievable. After 24 hours of this, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. Lights out. After an uncomfortable night, it was straight back to work. Task for today, turn round. One shovel, one pile of soil. Move that soil from there to in front of these rocks here. Understand? Understand. Two hours. Carry on.
But as the hours of imposed isolation dragged on, what had started off as a bit of harmless fun began to make everyone feel uncomfortable. 24 hours of back-breaking work and total obedience had left Jim feeling shattered. Jim's experience really made us think about the conditions those Victorian prisoners had to endure. Living history can be a fantastic way of bringing the past to life, but it does have its limitations. After all, you can step out of a reenactment whenever you like. And much against my better judgment, the governor has decided that your sentence is finished, so you are free to go. Oh, thank oh, goodness. Let's have a coffee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Reenactment can be enlightening, but it's certainly not the only way of gaining real insight into the past. Some of our most exciting experiments have involved carefully recreating what ancient people made. So what happens when archaeologists try and recreate the things that they find in their trenches? Well, then you tend to end up with things like this, which many people think are bringing us closer to our ancestors than was ever thought possible. This is how many of us imagine life for our ancestors, certainly in the Middle Ages. A world of muck and squalor. Get off my boots. If you had to somehow spend a day living the life of a medieval farmer, well, that's probably the impression that you'd come away with. But when archaeologists start to recreate the tools that medieval people used in order to farm and build their houses, well, you get a slightly different impression. On Time Team, we've been among the pioneers of a technique known as experimental archaeology, the process of rebuilding and replicating what we find buried in our trenches. And over the years, it's told us that while many of our ancestors might have been smelly, they were far from stupid. We found that out back in 2001, when Time Team was invited by the Ministry of Defence to help preserve an Iron Age settlement under their vast training ground at Salisbury Plain. We discovered two typical roundhouses, which looked pretty basic. But the foundations revealed almost nothing about what the houses looked like. We wanted to find out and see if we could learn the necessary building skills in just three days. From the evidence, we know their size. Um, we tend to know the direction of the doorway. Um, from classical descriptions, we know that they were thatched. So what's the next job after this? Well, we put this on, and um, once that's on, we're actually ready to do the roof or daub the walls. We haven't decided which way around to do it yet. That's yeah. going to be a muddy job, and That it? is a very muddy job, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to do that? Which we save for you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to slope off now. <laughs> right. I'll catch you later. <laughs> It's tempting to see these buildings as little more than glorified mud huts. The walls were covered with a filthy daub made from mud, straw and animal dung. Oh, it's all falling off. Push it, push it in. Push it. I'm pushing it in. You push it in. You where are you? Where are your hands you? off. You push it in, sort of slide your hands off. Oh, okay. Okay. It might be unpleasant, but this muddy mess was surprisingly effective. It certainly stops the wind coming in, doesn't it's it? It's incredible insulation. It's I amazing. Mean, Up here, it's really cold, yeah. really drafty. Down here, it's fine. And, of course, that's really important. I mean, we're on Salisbury Plains here. The wind is howling, and um, this would have been so important to be able to stay warm. We need some more dog. Just come in, boss. This simple technique perhaps explains why the design of these buildings remained the same for thousands of years. In fact, an Iron Age roof wouldn't look entirely out of place in a village today. The next lot goes over the top so that it stops, the rain comes down over the top of it. Yeah. Yeah. You do the underneath first right. to get the line, 
And what's happening here is the reed will rot wherever it's exposed. So the less that, it, that is exposed, the better. And by legating it up, you're left with just short bits. So you're really sort of chamfering it off then, chamfer really? Chamfer all the way up, and that will go all the way up the roof. It's a really clever so, technique. Would you like to have a go with that? Yeah, I would. I'd love to. I mean, I've seen you people to, use um, it. I've seen... If you take this arm and rest it on the reed that you're hitting, yeah. it stops it buckling up. I've seen people do this on, on thatched roofs. I didn't really understand why, but it all makes perfect sense now. I could get You're now a professional I thatcher. I could get attached to this. <laughs> In fact, the more we worked on our roundhouse, the more we began to appreciate the skill and effort which went into making one. Our experiment didn't just show us what a roundhouse might have looked like, it told us that even a building made from mud and straw can be surprisingly sophisticated. Hey, you've actually finished it. Yeah. Have you had a good time? Absolutely fantastic. The best three days of my life. <laughs> and you've even got a little fire there. That's yes. really nice, isn't it? And you doubted whether they'd do it. It was a huge undertaking, but um, I couldn't have done it without this team. They were superb. Kev, is it all finished now? Not quite, Tony. What have you got to do? Oh, oh the flag! Okay. <laughs> what does it say on the bottom there? With resolution and fidelity. What does that mean? It's <laughs> something you <laughs> 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 Building a roundhouse must have brought together an entire community. And at the ancient technology centre in Dorset, that spirit lives on. School children have helped archaeologists here to put up an Iron Age home, a Viking hall, and this huge earth house from the Isle of Man. All of these buildings are based on actual structures found by archaeologists, such as our own Francis Pryor. So, is it architecture that you learn about from this kind of thing, or can you discover anything about the people who actually made them? Well, you know a bit about architecture, Tony, but I think the main thing you learn about is the sort of techniques and technology. So, I mean, the, the skills that were pioneered in the Bronze Age still exist today, for example, in, in various trades, like, like plasterer, uh, and certainly carpenter. A lot of the joints that modern carpenters employ were actually invented in the Bronze Age. We know that for a fact. You always sound to me like you've really got a lot of respect for the people who were involved. I got huge respect, Tony. I mean, of course, they're more than just buildings. They're homes. They're certainly not huts, as some people have described them. On Time Team, we've found that these sorts of experiments can be applied to almost all aspects of everyday life, and they give us real insights into how people lived and worked. There can be no denying that over the last couple of decades, Time Team's discovered an awful lot of old rubbish, particularly literally thousands of pieces of broken pot. Now, these provide invaluable dating evidence but can archaeologists learn anything by reproducing them? If we could build an entire roundhouse in just three days, then making ancient pottery should have been a doddle. But in the year 2000, a dig at Wadden in Dorset proved otherwise. Sort the chat already. That's nice. Yeah, that's good, that's it. <laughs> Oh, great, I brought Tony to see the pottery. <laughs> well, all this came from your back garden? Yes. And this is just a tiny proportion of it as well. Dave just saved a sample. David James and Grace Brooks had invited us into their homes to see all the pottery that they'd found in their back gardens and to discover its source. This jumble of bits and pieces spans nearly 2,000 years of history, from 400 BC to the 14th century. When we set to work, we found an entire roundhouse in the back garden, which certainly explained the Iron Age pottery. And as a thank you present, we wanted to show David and Grace what their broken pots would have looked like in their original glory. But did we have the skills to reproduce Iron Age and medieval pottery? Can I give you a hand with anything? Yes, uh, we could do with you taking your boots off. We need this mixing up here with your feet. Taking my boots off? That's it. And start squidging down. Now we need more water. <laughs> Making medieval pottery was a time-consuming process. Even everyday tasks like this that appear easy 
can be much more difficult than they look. Each time a potter went to work, he had to build a new kiln, filling it with broken pottery, which helped to trap the heat from the fire and spread it across the floor. The clay pots were then moulded using an early version of a potter's wheel. She powers it, that's just inertia, you're not pedaling This is just the momentum of the wheel itself. I send it round with my hand, but it means I've got both feet on the ground. It keeps you steady. That's right. But 2,000 years earlier, in the Iron Age, pottery was much simpler, with vessels crafted entirely by hand. And the process carried greater risks because the pots were placed directly into an open fire. It's really exciting to actually got this all lit at last. I've been looking forward to it all day, and now the firing's well underway. And that's the medieval pots in the mud kiln? That's right, in the big mounded up thing there. And then the Iron Age pots are just sitting in the bonfire. It's called a clamp kiln, but it's just a bonfire in a pit, basically. The next morning brought the moment of truth. Had our pots risen from the ashes? They all seem to be broken at the moment, Jim. Is that because in order to do the experimental firing in the time we had available, we put them in a bit when they were a bit wet? That's right. Normally we've got at least two weeks before for the drying process. We had a so day. A day <laughs> was... Oh, dear. In our haste to fire the pots, we'd ended up breaking every single one. But it wasn't a complete disaster. We had managed to match the colour of the original vessels. Force this through... So oh, look at that. Look. look. And that's red. That's beautiful. That's and the burnishing is... Show you, have you got that one there? It's looking very similar. And I'll see what else we have. Right. And I'll start revealing the pots underneath. Our medieval kiln was much more successful. But the whole experiment showed us just how difficult it can be to replicate something as ordinary as a piece of pottery. Is this one? Oh, yes. That is, oh, that is yes. yes. This was yes. made in the year 1346. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could have been, couldn't it? It's incredible to think that centuries of trial and error would have gone into the creation of even this most basic of beakers, which just goes to show why it's so difficult to reproduce ancient skills once they're lost. But the reality is, this is just an imitation, no matter how hard it is to produce. So the only way experimental archaeologists can really check whether or not they've got their replicas right is to put them to the ultimate test. When we see the pace of change in our own society, it's tempting to view the past as a primitive time, particularly those periods when technologies didn't change for hundreds of years. But present-day archaeologists are beginning to challenge those preconceptions by recreating ancient technologies and seeing how well they perform. In 2001, a team of archaeologists found the burnt and twisted remains of a machine the Romans used to lift water at the bottom of a deep and muddy well in the city of London. Sadly, the only pieces that had survived were these square oak buckets and a few small pieces of the metal structure. But together, they suggested that this was a sophisticated machine which appeared to be unique in the known Roman world. But what did this machine look like and how did it work? The only way to find out was to build a full-sized replica, which the Museum of London hoped to put on display. In many ways, it was like starting with a blank sheet of paper, and right from the start, we disagreed over just how authentic the experiment should be. And for understanding the way the machine operates, I don't think it's essential to do everything in the Roman way. Explain what you mean when you say uh, we're not going to be able to do everything in the Roman way. Surely that's the whole point of it, isn't uh, it? Well, no, this is a machine, and um, if we were to do everything in the Roman way, we'd have to eat what they ate for breakfast, wear the clothing they wore, and then use exactly the right kind of iron. So with any experimental archaeology project, you make compromises. But one Roman method we did try was forging the iron links which held the wheel chain together.
When we compared our ones to the originals using X-rays, we found out that we'd managed to hammer and stretch the metal in almost exactly the same way the Romans did. Yeah, well, when we X-rayed the real artifacts, the ancient ones, and the ones that were made by the blacksmith... We so could which tell, is which? This is an ancient one, the Roman one. Yeah. And this is the one that Phil made. It is kind of eerie that over 1,500 years after these things were made, by examining like this, yeah. you can work out the techniques that the guys who made it used. Yeah, it's a bit forensic archaeology. Yeah. But on a project this size, it was impractical to do everything without the aid of modern technology. And as our machine started to take shape, Time Team's Mick Aston began to wonder if we were making something which no Roman would have recognised. I mean, this, this fits beautifully the way I've done it at the moment, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, it's, I'm amazed at what a, a sort of tight fit you've got on that. Mm. What amazes me even more, and I know this has nothing to do with you, but it's the design, is how complicated this is with the angles. I know. And I, know. I, I find it actually impossible to believe that that's what the Romans would have done. I think it would have to have been simpler than that. Mick worried that we'd been too precise and over-engineered the machine, fears which proved justified when it was finally slotted together. There. Woo, 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 woo. See up there? Isn't that link catching on the flank? The water wheel chain kept slipping out of position. It began to look like the whole design was flawed, and some of us began to entertain dark thoughts. What worries me really, I suppose, is that, you know, the archaeological evidence is a bunch of those boxes in the bottom of the well. Perhaps they had the same problem. It didn't bloody work. I and mean, that's the, the debris in the bottom of the hole. <laughs> Even a bit of on-the-job maintenance couldn't get it to go. And then we wondered, perhaps putting water in it would change the way it worked. Here it goes. <laughs> Success at last. The buckets are lifting water. This was a fantastic moment. And it made us appreciate the immense practicality and common sense of those Roman engineers who lived so long ago. Their machine might have been less complex, but we're sure this is how it worked. And the water wheel's still going strong today at its new home in the ancient technology centre. Luke! <laughs> Bill. This is amazing. I mean, it's like an old friend to me. So you've obviously had it for a fair amount of time. You've been able to run it. And just how effective is it? Well, we've put a counter on the main gear wheel, um, and that counts the number of revolutions. And last term, although the children only use it for about 10 minutes each day, the machine moved over 240 tonnes of water. So very efficient. Apart from that, is it as we built it, or have you modified it at all? We're running a continuous experiment on the main gear wheel as well, the bucket wheel, um, and we've put different shoes of fruit woods onto the main drive teeth uh, and over time we're recording how they wear so that at the end hopefully we can get an idea of the actual woods used in that drive wheel. What do you get out of, of how you feel about the Romans, the people who built it? I think once again a machine, a recreation like this demonstrates the efficiency of people in the past. We tend to think of people sort of living in dark houses and, and living very austere lifestyles but a machine like this shows the practicalities and the way that people can modify the world around them. And looking at the way the kids are actually enjoying Join it. It's a lot of fun Absolutely too. Absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic, isn't it, when you see something like this? All right, it might not be 100% accurate, but you get a little glimmer of what it would have been like to live in Roman London. Not only that, but you also get something of an understanding of how complex it would have been to build it and maintain it. Water management on this scale didn't appear again in the streets of London until the 17th and 18th centuries. But successful ancient technology doesn't have to be as complicated as the wheel. At High Urkel House in Shropshire, Time Team came across a remarkable story of ingenuity in the face of overwhelming odds. In the Civil War, 
A few hundred royalists turned this old manor house into a formidable fortress, capable of holding off Oliver Cromwell's army for nine months. We think they did it by building an earth rampart topped with what were known as gabions. Phil was asked to knock one together, but could these simple sand-filled wicker baskets really withstand the impact of a cannonball? There was only one way to find out. Solid target. That's two tons of earth in there. My, my impression of it has gone up leaps and bounds. I still await to see what happens when a cannonball hits it. Well, so do I now. So, Derek, I think this is quite a momentous occasion for oh, you it too, is isn't indeed, it? indeed, yes. <laughs> I mean, have you ever fired one of these before? Never. Not live. We fired blank. That's incredible, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely it is, incredible. It's, it's, it's your yeah. cannon, presumably. Uh, actually, it belongs to Newark Garrison. I'm the person who looks after it. I'm its registered minder. And, w I mean, aren't you bothered about maybe us busting it up? A bit, yes. <laughs> I'm slightly <laughs> apprehensive. So here it was, the moment of truth. Yes! Got it! <laughs> oh, hey! Look at that! Phil was gobsmacked by how well his rough-and-ready gabion performed. It absorbed the cannon fire with barely a scratch. That's two-thirds of the way through. Two-thirds of the way through. So it's not even touched the back wall. wall. Archaeological experiments are beginning to tell us just how practical and sophisticated ancient people could be. But how far can experimental archaeology go? OK, we can throw old-fashioned pots, we can put old-fashioned food inside it and eat out of them, but is it possible to get into the minds of people who lived so long ago that historical records simply don't exist? Well, it can be worth trying if we peer beyond the physical realm into the world of myths and legends. For thousands of years, societies have struggled with questions posed by our very existence. Who are we? What happens to us when we die? Experimental archaeology can help give us a glimmer of appreciation of what people's lives might have been like, but can we ever truly understand what it was they believed? Well, it's not quite so much of a stretch as you might imagine. Millions of us recreate the past without even realising it. Most of the festivals we celebrate predate modern Christianity. Not all are as dramatic as the burning of a wicker man, which we recreated on Anglesey, but even Christmas and Easter have pagan elements. Many of our myths and legends have their roots in prehistory, and with a little creative thinking, we can throw light on their origins. King Arthur is perhaps the most famous of all. Arthur was mythologised as a medieval knight in the Round Table stories, but many historians believe he was actually a 5th century chief who lived after the end of the Roman Empire. But in 2003, Time Team wondered whether the story of his sword drawn from a stone could have its origins in a real activity that was a lot older than Arthur himself, the casting of a Bronze Age weapon. And the only way to find out was to try it for ourselves. It's almost like to me as though there's some sort of great mythical beast in there that's snoring away. Yeah. <laughs> it does like a dragon or something. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's deep in sleep, but he's down in there somewhere. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure there were no dragons involved, but there is a little bit of magic in the casting of a prehistoric sword. Bronze is made by mixing two metals together. The first is tin, which melts fairly quickly, but the second, copper, needs to be superheated to over a thousand degrees Celsius before it starts to melt. At 1150 degrees, it starts to glow, a transformation which heralds the moment when liquid bronze can be taken out of the fire. Amazing. It was melted gold. Yeah. 
Oh, oh what's well, that for? Some alchemy. God, you can see because you're going. Oh, look at that. Then poured into a stone mould. God, you can look. You can see the light down the oh, side. Oh, well, you can see it coming out the, 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 the cracks. Yeah. You can hear it. You can hear it fill up. up too. Yeah. Oh, you can see it turn. You can see it going dull too. It's an intriguing but plausible idea that the legend of drawing the sword in the stone could have started like this: someone separating two halves of a stone mould and pulling out a sword. <laughs> Look at that, eh? And all this is the flashing where it was uh, venting yeah. through the sides. It's all come out nicely. That's brilliant. So that is the sword out of the stone, then? That is. Yeah, it is exactly <laughs> the sword out <laughs> yeah, of the stone. stone. To prehistoric people, this would have been a very powerful and symbolic moment. They might even have seen it as a moment of birth and named it. Is it finished? It is done. Excalibur. That's amazing. Bronze Age swords were so highly prized that many were left in water as gifts for whatever gods ancient people believed in. Archaeologist Francis Pryor, who came up with our version of the sword in the stone, believes the ability to think our way into the past is crucial if we're to understand a world dominated by signs and symbols. I think archaeology is obsessed with description rather than explanation. You know, satellites allow you to survey a site almost instantly. And then, of course, geophys sees below the ground, and you have these incredible maps. And in a way, we've become obsessed with describing things, but not explaining them. Because description never says why or how a particular site got used. But you're just as guilty of this as anybody else. The number of times I've heard you use the word ritual without defining what you mean by it at all. Well, you're right, Tony. I mean, I think sometimes I've been guilty of this myself. If you don't understand something, you say, oh, it's ritual. But in actual fact, I mean, ritual does matter. Religion does matter. I mean, we've got problems today due to religion. And if you're going to understand a site like Stonehenge, you've got to go beyond the practicality, you know, the, the description of those great stones. You know, why? What was the motivation? What drove people to do it? And I think somehow archaeologists must have the courage to use their imaginations and reconstruct these ancient patterns of thought. And in 1999, experimental archaeology helped us to interpret one of the most mysterious monuments in the Bronze Age world. On a beach near home in Norfolk, the retreating tide had revealed a ring of 55 buried timber posts surrounding a huge upside-down oak tree. It was christened Sea Henge, and the race was on to save it before its secrets were destroyed by the cruel North Sea. But the decision to dig Sea Henge up and then cut samples from it for testing was highly controversial. The archaeologists ran into trouble with local people and modern pagans, who were angry at what they saw as the desecration of a sacred site. Cutting pieces out of it and taking down the outer circle is not going to help us really understand it at a, a deeper level. It might help on the intellectual level, oh yeah, mm -hmm. this bit was dated to such and such a day, but not to really understand why us here uh, and what, what, what they 
the, the motivation was by putting it there and, and such like. This was a clash between science and spirituality. But at the end of the day, neither side could say what Sea Henge might have looked like when it was first built. So Time Team decided to make a full-sized reconstruction of it using Bronze Age technology. The first step was to fell the oak trees using bronze axes. This was hard going. Yeah, look at that, Damien. Look, it's completely bent the edge of the blade. Yeah. Look, oh. Total S-shaped. But in many ways, it was the easy bit. The big question was how did Bronze Age people move something this big? The answer was hidden inside the tree itself. That is a bloody towing hole. That is a towing hole. That is unbelievable. These strands of honeysuckle looked like an ancient rope. But were they really strong enough to drag a tree this big? There was only one way to find out. Oh, right. no, we're OK. Get some skids ready. Right. Oh, hang on, hang on. Can we just... Hey, hey. Come on, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep going. Ah. No. That's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey! Our experiment answered a lot of questions about how Sea Henge was put together. But it raised many more about why it was built. It is weird. I mean, when you look at that stump inverted, that is a most, most weird thing. And my experience of Bronze Age archaeology is there's weirdness everywhere in the Bronze Age. And this is one of the weirdest things you're ever going to see. So what do you think that stump in the ground might have meant? Well, I think it's to do with, uh, well, it may be functioning as an altar or some kind of table, but why use a tree like that? I mean, it's an awful lot of effort to go to. They could have made a similar st a platform much more easily. I think the symbolism of the, the spring felled oak going into the earth is, is pretty solid. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that's a terribly male perspective, that is. That's <laughs> typical, the idea. It's a big male fertilisation thing. Of a, I think... I think it's all about containing the tree. I think it's, it's almost disposing of the tree. It's something the tree is being neutralised almost. It's much more like getting rid of it. It's a burial for the tree. I hate to sound arrogant. I'm in no doubt at all. It was a mortuary structure. So that's a, a specially built structure to do with death and the migration of a soul into the next world. It's deliberately going down. The tree is a sort of symbol of life and it's pointing down to another world below the surface. But I think what is amazing about this reconstruction is it really gets your brain going. That's it. That's it. It's only when you come inside it that you begin to get some kind of feeling of why those Bronze Age people would have been prepared to invest such an enormous amount of labour with such rudimentary tools in chopping that big tree down, lugging it however far they lugged it, and then inverting it and dropping it into this big hole. Because whatever it was for, it still has an enormous sense of power and mystery around it. You know that feeling that you get when you go into a dark and empty church and there's no one around? I don't know what that feeling's all about, but that's what you get here. Perhaps none of our theories about Sea Henge were completely right, but the one thing this and other experiments have told us about the lives of our ancestors is that they were as rich and complicated as our own. By reconstructing the past, by building the homes ancient people lived in, using their tools, experiencing their places of worship, we can truly appreciate how sophisticated they were. I suppose there's a part of all of us that tends to have a sort of Monty Python bigotry, that because ancient people worked in natural materials like wood and mud, they must have been a bit thick. Well, yes. I mean, one of the things that I've really got out of the practical work 
is just how skilled they were. I mean, they were not thick. And in fact, you know, were you to take away our mobile phones, our sat navs, and all the other clever modern technology, and just chuck it away and say, right, mate, you're back in the Victorian period, you're back in the Bronze Age, survive, we wouldn't stand a hope. And I think the, the other thing, too, is, is, is the way that, that individuals interact with other people in their community. Mm. You could not undertake most of the jobs that we've done in isolation. A lot of the, the things that we've done have been collaborative. People working together. And those communities in the past really did rely on one another for their success. I think what we can do is try to learn more about their worldview, the way they would have thought about their families, their ideas maybe of religion, and then with any luck, we might put ourselves in a position where we understand not how they thought, but maybe why they thought what they did. And with any luck, that will bring us closer to them. So, as a toast, would you accept to the creativity of our ancestors? Oh, I like it. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. You can examine the series' 20-year history by exploring the Time Team map at channel4.com slash timeteam. A new series tonight on Four Secret Millions, supporting big charitable ideas. George Clark is first up with a radical housing project at eight. But next this afternoon, we'll deal with Noel.